Well, thank you, the stage is mine. <laughs> welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for being here. This is, uh, I, I, I called Frank earlier and said, this is the best session of the day. <laughs> this is right before we have a big celebration. Hopefully, you all had a great day. And uh, this should have been in a happy hour environment at the Beacon Max So we get more creative and innovative participation from the attendees. Anyway, well, thank you, thanks for being here. I, um, the session is the uh, MC just talked about was nurturing creativity and innovation. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of, it's, it's a packed topic. It's, it's a lot of things to talk about. Uh, but today we're gonna look at the relationship between uh, China and Vietnam, what we learned from each other, uh, the theme of Oasis China meeting and happening in a host country such as Vietnam. And we have a fantastic uh, uh, panel, including, uh, let me do the first introductions, and they can take a few minutes to talk about a uh, brief uh, 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 one minute to talk about themselves, about their background. Uh, Dr. Claudia Bakley, former members of the Swiss Federal Parliament, Chairman of Swiss New Water, and Simba L. Swiss. Um, on my right is uh, Dan Cates, founder of Dan Cates Foundation from the U.S. Um, on the far left, Mr. Duke Dan, the Director of Science, Technology, and Industrial Park at Comex, and last but not least, our uh, Professor Wang uh, Executive Director of Institute of Global Cooperation and Understanding at Peking University of China, thank you for being here. So, before we, we, we do the introduction, uh, self-introduction, Let's, let's set the stage for the differences between uh, creativity and innovation. Creativity is a, a, a place where let your big dreams and hopes and ideas spell out without any boundaries. You can talk about space travel, you can talk about uh, migrating to a different planet, you can talk about changing uh, uh, fossil fuel into something 100% um, renewable energy. But innovation, what makes the difference, is a committed group of entrepreneurs or talented individuals that is not scared of anything, that they come together and they realize that dreams and apples from creative values. So the big difference is companies like uh, uh, Apple, for example, great innovative company. The iPhone, FaceTime, iPad, all these technologies, all these things, is not a regional idea. They are not a regional idea. They've done, they've been there before, but they've done a fantastic job at turning into something practical and successful that is widely adopted uh, by many people and organizations in the world. Um, go back to space travel, as you Blue Origin is from uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, SpaceX, from uh, Elon Musk and uh, uh, the, the billionaire Richard Branson says, Virgin Galactic. The dreams is space travel or migration to a different planet. But they are also great entrepreneurs that they venture out and they're trying to make that happen by creating these technologies and companies, testing it out and make sure that it's practical and realistic. So today, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, we're going to talk about creativity and innovation uh, between Vietnam and China and how we can help create a foundation for entrepreneurs to be more successful. But go back to, uh, let me give these panelists the floor for one or two minutes max to do a brief introduction about yourself, Dr. Kwon.
benefit, which is technical technological, and innovation, which is its application issues. Now, I think there are three categories. First category, if you are speaking of a small, medium, highly specialized company, like you have many in Germany and in Switzerland, 200 people, watch majors, they would do the development by themselves. They would keep it in-house. They would have a few handicraft specialists who would do a very, very narrow segment. They would invent and implement. So this is where innovation and invention and innovation would be in the same spot. The opposite. If you take the pharma industry, they control the whole range of products. It's complicated to develop a new molecule. So they prefer to let startups try. Many would die in the process. Some would be successful. When it becomes too expensive for the startup, for example, for the human level trial, so then the pharma company jumps in, put 200, 300 million dollars, and gets an ownership or a co-ownership of that. And this is protected by IP. Now in between, you have, you mentioned, for example, mobile telephone. Uh, it's a bit difficult to be protected by IP because everybody has maybe six months lead on the others. Everybody is more or less in the same boat. Uh, also, if you take very large companies, you would do internal development. For example, I worked for Nestle. In Nestle, it was quite interesting. We had development companies. I'm not talking fundamental research. This is done very much in house. But developing companies. I was personally in charge of Latin America. So the idea was, my role was at that time, it's a long time ago, talk with each of the Nestle companies of South America to see what are the Make a plan of what would be the growth of organic, what would be the growth by acquisition, what the growth by IND. And we had an IND center specific for Latin America, looking at developing goods based on local raw material, corresponding to the local consumption habits, and being nutrition. So you see, it's the, the last slide of the innovation. So the technology comes from much behind, but in order to adjust the local resources and the local needs, then it makes a lot of sense to have a team, there were like 80 of scientists, who would work on the field and make sure that they can reach the target. Dr. Bigman, thank you very much. I, I want to do a short one minute introduction so, so people get the background. Maybe, uh, one minute to talk about your background a little bit. Go ahead. Free. Yes, yes. Microphone. Mike, Dr. Beagle, microphone. <laughs> I'm kind of a humble of addiction because I worked in the public sector, started in diplomacy, worked in the Swiss Parliament, that made most of my career in the private sector uh, with large multinationals. And now, has launched a startup as a first career activity. Uh, it's difficult to run a startup when you have uh, dozens of thousands of employees, or hundreds of thousands of employees. It's difficult, but at the same time, it's extremely difficult because uh, you, Take the risk. Instead of every month being paid, you have to pay your staff. Uh, instead of spending time in corporate politics, you define the goal. And I must say for all of the people in the room who have gone through a high level corporate career, come into startup. Startup is not only for people of 20 years. That can also go gray hair, white hair, and uh, it's really fun.
Thank you. Dan. So I come from a bit of a different background in many ways, and my approach towards innovation and creativity is a little bit different in a way as well. It's not so, not exactly tech oriented, but it, I think technology is super important. So uh, my background originally is from did, uh, having extreme success from professional poker and finding a way to bridge the gap between that and doing something in the direction of creating positive impact which is a long story, but involves directions and uh, focusing on sports and the entertainment industry, putting things into practice through me, by example, and creating well, what I determined eventually was to be communities, uh, which I believe would foster, would foster habits of such things such as innovation and creativity, which I believe that is what I wanted my focus around was, okay, here are these virtues that people can have, how do we actually create them? And I decided, well, I want to create systems in place to make this possible and be a presence in the media to, to reflect those changes. So I realized, okay, well, in order to make these changes, firstly, I have to be an example myself and be innovative and creative and put the most positive here, whatever other virtues I want to reflect. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was what led me to creating the Dan Gates Foundation, uh, along with the fact that for a long time I realized, you know, I really want to do something, I'm doing one of these things for myself, and I have to orient myself towards the, the puzzle direction, so I decided to, to create the foundation, which I, related to that, I decided to focus on children's education, which I believe would lead towards maximum impact in the realms of such as innovation and creativity, if you can make people creative from when they're very young and, and, and do things that are positive for the world, create great technology or whatever it is, then the world will expound greatly. Uh, and that's how it's what led me to creating a, to this idea of creating communities, which I can do directly and uh, and create a, a mutually beneficial existence between me and the people within my community towards uh, creating other sustainable systems that lead towards uh, even technological developments or other sorts of things that will be beneficial for society at large. Uh, so that's roughly where I'm at uh, in the process of making communities to foster these kinds of traits and uh, now looking into the actual process of models towards making them reality. Thank, thank you, Dan. Uh, why go? Um, I I'm from the uh, background as an professor teaching at the university, so so that I actually like very much uh, the way I uh, um, start with that this is uh, academic. You know, you usually we love to begin with uh, definitions, uh, and indeed this is also what I teach to my students. Try to you know, encourage them to be creative, innovative, using how we really push the frontier for the production of, uh, of money. But when, it's, when it comes to creativity and innovation in business, um, I'd like to share with you uh, sharing with some data. Um, the uh, Global Innovation uh, Report uh, 2023 last year it shows that China is actually not good at the middle income. Economies uh, has made the most uh, headways. So, uh, now China is the only one that ranks among the top. Um, and uh, uh, when the GRI report first released in, in 2007, uh, over the years, China now um, has, has last year, China ranked uh, number 12. That is quite impressive for the uh, developing economy. Uh, some other important in indicators, uh, such as like, patents, um, academic papers, in uh, top journals, um, and uh, in uh, um, two thousand twenty-two, China filed over patent internationally, uh, accounting for forty-six point eight percent of the world total. By contrast, the United States uh, filed over uh, five. 90,000 uh, uh, 
patrons internet and we for about uh, 17 feet uh, room total. And NED, um, the Shenzhen city of Bombay uh, province, alone in uh, 2022, uh, filed uh, close to uh, 16,000 uh, people, which I just think very close to uh, the number of uh, homes, which is uh, a little bit longer. And of course, the number of the uh, papers published besides the top journals in 2022, uh, China also had one uh, with over 92,000 uh, papers published and uh, six, uh, about 650,000 citations. Jiang Trail uh, with over 78,000 papers published and over 300,000 uh, citations. And, and also last but not least, China's IND uh, 2022 has surpassed the world now to, uh, in the world, trading only after the United States, and uh, 20% of the total uh, IND uh, worldwide. So, but is that mean that China is now the most important? Probably not, because I would like to uh, also get back to uh, what you call China, I think, has been really a comparative advantage in uh, application of those knowledge. A lot of those findings are most in the field of application uh, of the uh, um, uh, appliances. So, so I think China is still uh, going forward. I think China needs to put more investment in, in quality the basic uh, uh, you know, improving its uh, creativity and innovation, uh, more uh, investment in uh, the basic science. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here and very humble to be here with the uh, distinguished uh, panelists um, from various seniors, um, members from Swiss Union, from, from USA, and also from China. Uh, my name is Dick. I'm from Born in Vietnam, educated in Singapore, and coming back to Vietnam, uh, I'm joining Bank of Mexico, is the leading industrial park in township developing in the country. Uh, we have uh, more than 21 uh, industrial parks across the whole country, and, uh, across the whole country in uh, 15 provinces. And uh, so today, uh, currently, I'm in charge of Buffalo about innovations, uh, science, technology, industrial parks, which is the new generation of industrial park in, in, in Vietnam. How we are going to sort of uh, for the past 10 years of industrialization is when we have opened the economy. Uh, so now is the key challenge is how we can move up the value chains and how we can drive the economy uh, by innovations, by science technology uh, activities. Uh, so that is also um, today's discussion is something that's very close to my heart and my passion is uh, how we can continue to drive uh, the economic uh, development in Brazil, in Vietnam in general, uh, by uh, bringing in more innovative activity. So for, for my definition is basically the uh, definition is that innovation is, is something uh, when it turns idea, knowledge, or patents, etc. into something uh, that can make money uh, to bring value to the market. So it's not on the papers, on the sales, or research, etc. So how we can uh, fuel that process to bring in more value to the society. So, uh, Recent years, we've seen a lot of um, great exposure and coverage for Vietnam's economic growth. Vietnam is in a great place that uh, lots of international investors, a lot of foreign investors come in. Oh, we're back. Um, it's like a bit which you said is trying to drive up the value chain in what we do. In terms of manufacturing, in terms of agriculture, and so forth, China has done that for a long time. And China is is, is the hub for high tech manufacturing, and they want to do more of semiconductor, AI development, and so forth. Let's look at entrepreneurship from within um, a large scale organization or a startup. So innovation, all the corporates, all the big companies out there, they try to innovate. They have two ways to do it. One, they go invest into startups, or they can grow from within. 
Um, the question is, uh, for Cloud, you've been exposed to both for your experience with uh, uh, DHL, with Nestle. Can you share the perspectives of why corporate work should be or should not incubate ideas versus um, funding or sourcing, soliciting some different stuff for innovative products or things that align with their strategy? Thank you very much. First of all, it should not be from Europe to India. It goes both ways. And I would very much imagine that in the future, when people come this part of the world, they may come to the headquarters and not just for things for direct investment. I believe that everybody has something to win from mutual partnership. Second, I see that the people in the West were wrong when they believe that here people only go let go. This is really wrong. I was privileged in 2008 to be very much involved in a high-level political conference between Germany and China on sustainability and climate protection. We had ministers from both sides. We had CEOs of very large companies of both sides. Chinese, to a large extent, knew as much as German, and Chinese were doing some experiments which had gone beyond what we in Europe were doing. While, if you would ask for public opinion, in the West, everybody would think that it's all coming from the West. It was not true. Chinese were not happy. Chinese were developed. When we see today what happened with the photovoltaic industry, uh, clearly there is an edge, probably with artificial intelligence, different sectors. So we need a cooperation, and it's a win win between the two. Vietnam and China. Maybe I will here say something which I don't want to hurt some of my Chinese friends, but it's the reflection of a Chinese himself, actually a member of the CBPCC. He believes that if you have video cameras while a university professor speaks, the freedom to express what he really believes is limited because nobody wants to make mistakes. So he had the idea, and I believe it's a very interesting idea, <coughs> to have a zone in a neighboring country, which was very close to China, where there would be a little more freedom for the researchers, kind of a Silicon Valley of the East, so that people can take more risks in their thinking and therefore be more creative. I think the idea was a good idea because after you can of course have all this pillar doing China itself. Both China and Vietnam have a sense of discipline, which for example I do not find in India. Both China and Vietnam have a sense of hard work, which I for example do not see so much. In Europe. You have a car to pay. What is important is to put that freedom of thought, that's maybe the very missing thing, and to have that capability to transform the idea to reality. They can I came now several times here, and freely impressed by the way how they built an implementation university. They have all the tools here. 
so that if you want to invent something, and then you want to create a machine, they have the machine to create those machines. So they have done the investment so that somebody who would come, be Vietnamese or be foreigner, is able to implement the innovation. And many of the technological parts which I've seen in China sit down the city. So my only wish would be that Vietnam and China can cooperate closely together because there is a real complementarity. There are a lot of things in common that we need, uh, especially the sense of the discipline of our work. I would still think Japan and Korea and Pakistan. So here you are a world leader and there are others. Try to find those complementarities because you will both win jointly. I think the, the, the modern developed societies in Europe, or you mentioned um, South Korea or Japan, have done a fantastic job. Look at uh, Toyota, look at uh, Sony, they have innovation from within. You go back to, to the thing with Vietnam, it's still a very new economy. There are a lot of large organizations in Vietnam, but innovation is not coming from within. Um, startups are very obvious. They have to be quite competitive. They have uh, 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 build things. They fail quickly. Um, maybe this question for one to, to, to talk about from your perspective in China. You see larger organizations, they can also innovate. And, and is that in that area, what can Vietnam learn from it? Large organizations in Vietnam, I see, they are trying to do that, but it's not very. Uh, uh, much creating a big culture change for other uh, large companies in Vietnam to follow. Um, I think this is, uh, there is constant, I think, in, in the business school, it's got a big company fees, right? We all know that. Uh, when the big companies uh, you know, sort of become complacent on their edge, uh, and eventually uh, sort of stagnate for them. And it happened just so, Particularly, I think for many big companies uh, over the years, uh, it's, 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 it's so typical. So, uh, so what we need to do is that really, uh, I think a couple of things, I think, uh, is that we have to shrink the size, right? build down these steps, build, build up, and we do cut uh, through the uh, train of the anticipation. We also have to break the uh, information flow is loose. Um, and, and all together creating um, and a company culture that really va uh, uh, values uh, innovation. I, 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 I recall a couple of years ago, I visited some sort of high tech companies in China. Uh, they really created something, we also use this concept to call itself for studies of international relations. It's just the, the, the idea is that uh, the innovation really not come from, you know, top down, but rather bottom down. Uh, and that they have this mechanism of, uh, of creating, uh, encouraging uh, their employees within their company to start uh, doing, you know, stuff. And then they come up with ideas, and then they, they could start their own business, and the company sort of, well, uh, play the role as a venture capital. I think this is uh, perhaps a way uh, 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 to go. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a couple of things, uh, uh, very last point, you, you, you mentioned about the, uh, the culture there. Um, I, think, I think traditionally there is the conventional wisdom is that uh, Confucian culture tends to be conservative, right? And by emphasizing authority. And, um, and uh, in fact, a lot of people believing that um, Confucianism is against so, so to a great extent, I think, uh, in many ways, as in Vietnam and China, and I share this very similar challenges because we both share uh, the heritage of the Confucian culture. Uh, but I think what we need to do is a modern transformation of, uh, for instance, the Confucian uh, cultural heritage. For instance, I think the Confucian culture's emphasis on education 
is very much conducive to creating abundant human capital that equal to key right, to uh, the industrializations in so many uh, developing uh, economies such as uh, uh, China uh, and Vietnam. So, so I think, yes, I think, you know, if you think about uh, the efficientism, there are some areas, but uh, there are also ways to, uh, to try to push for more interest in those changes. This segues to something that we, I, I strongly believe in. Starting something, building something, is a great way to learn. We're not afraid of failure, right? But that's, that's different in a very different culture. So in, in uh, I, I want to ask this question, maybe Dick can talk about it, so for the audience to understand the different perspectives. You've got Vietnam, China, the US, and uh, Switzerland. So are there cultural barriers to companies as a leader? If I were a big corp, symptom, I was the CEO, I'm not encouraging it because many failed projects reflect very poorly on me under my leadership. But that's not very good. That's just under on, it's just death to innovation. It's everybody's scared of starting something and it's hurting their KPI. Um, second part would be societal way. Is a barrier So failing? That's preventing people from doing uh, a new startup or great new division in their business. Maybe you can talk about that from a bigger bank perspective. So I, I think I'm, I'm going to share the context of in general in Vietnam. So how we see that uh, Vietnam is an emerging company, uh, emerging uh, economy. When we see that uh, the country is in the process to accumulate capital. Um, so I think there is a very big uh, turning point when we can transition from short-term gains to long-term gains. When we talk about um, whether we can invest for long-term or we are going to invest for the short-term and get the returns. I think that is a very strong, very important paradigm shift. Uh, when economies um, move up to a certain level, that they can accept the higher level of risk tolerance. They can accept failure. Failure doesn't mean that they are going to go for like, um, at the end of their the company, the end of their life, etc. So when economies at a certain stage, they are still, I think, mean, embracing failure is still something that is, is quite strange and quite unacceptable, especially in the uh, Eastern cultures, um, in the Eastern cultures where um, we, we are not like uh, Silicon Valley, we are not uh, in the Western world where experiments of um, uh, accepting further as a process of uh, learning. Um, so I think that is the very critical organization that we need to uh, move over in order to propel the innovation process to be taking place in a very strong way. So when the company is still thinking about, uh, I make the investment today, so what is the return for the next one, two, or three years? Um, we need to shift to think about um, when we do r &D, when we do um, uh, deep tech, we take five years, we take 10 years, and then we can expect the return. So only the companies or the economy that can afford that, they need to accumulate certain capital so that they can uh, invest for the long term. So I think that is, in terms of cultural and also in terms of uh, structure, uh, structures of the economy. So we need, need to move from different stages of development. And also, like uh, Dr. Wang Dong also shared about, I think um, we, are, we share the Confucian uh, uh, cultures where the higher thing is there. Uh, the top down is mostly, is most uh, prevalent uh, cultures in the economy where the top is much more powerful, so how we can embrace or we can empower the bottoms to come up with new ideas because they are the one who are closer to uh, the customer, they are closer to the market uh, transitions or uh, transformation. So uh, how to how to empower that bottom-up uh, initiative to rising up in the organization is also very important to fuel um, uh, development of innovation especially. And I think at the end of the day, so innovation is about experiment. You do 10 experiments, you do 100 experiments, you want to do 1,000 of experiments. And if you keep trying to do that until you get it right, and then the, that single uh, success will bring you 1,000 or 3 or billions of, uh, uh, billions of returns. Uh, 
So that is the, the, the metrics, or that is the nature of innovation. So how we are going to transition that cultural shift and also mentality shift in, in the society and also in the economy. So that is very important. And I think uh, China uh, is about 10 or 15 years ahead of Vietnam, and then um, China become a superpower in terms of innovation. It's now and a lot of lessons that we can learn from China as well. But let's go back to China first, because maybe Dan, you could talk about it from the American culture, and more specifically in your states, how do we get encourage more innovations and not afraid of being failed or, or tainted your reputation in the industry? So, uh, one thing is I feel like the uh, American side of things is a little bit uh, more connected towards the European side of uh, culture than to. China, uh, at least in my personal experience, I do think uh, in terms of innovation and uh, creativity and in terms of uh, mm, well, the, um, we, we have a really great mindset in terms of pushing forward all these kinds of aspects uh, in many different ways, not just uh, for the sake of progress. Uh, I mean, Elon Musk is such a perfect example of all this. He's uh, incredibly innovative and, uh, and uh, is going as full force towards uh, pushing things to the maximum as much as possible with like his goals and all these other things. Um, I do think that American culture could learn a lot from, especially Eastern cultures, a uh, little bit close off. Uh, especially in terms of things such as discipline uh, and from elements of Confucianism itself, I was actually pleasantly surprised when I went to China and learned so much about how differently like, the Chinese and the Asians in general just thought radically differently from the U.S. And I think that the U.S. has a couple of fallacies in that they want to very free in the way that we, we think. Um, we we do lose sight of a lot of the traditional aspects of some of those things that are really important are found in Confucianism, ironically. And we, I do think we're a little bit, uh, mm. sometimes I get the impression that uh, innovation, while it's very, very everything and all that, I think there's lots of value in mixing cultures and just like, and just uh, getting perspectives from totally different places, uh, especially from China. I was very, very surprised and learned a lot even from my limited experience with the Chinese and uh, with uh, other cultures of Asia and it was more fascinating by how different it was and how high expanding uh, all these sorts of things were that even impressed by sometimes even more innovative than the, the thing uh, from the inter inventors. It seems like they're even rivals to Elon Musk in terms of, uh, in terms of innovation and, uh, and technology. Maybe. So it's more cultural mixing would be great. Thank you. I, I, I also want to be mindful of time and anyway. we talked a little bit uh, too much about the public sector and maybe uh, Wang and Paul can talk about the, 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 the role of the public sector. Right? So in, in terms of organizations, startup or large enterprises, they have control. They can initiate projects, they can start something, investment uh, through different channels. What about the role of the public sector? How can government encourage uh, a path towards organization can be more natural in a way that uh, build innovative projects and solutions uh, in any sector? Claude? It can, of course, support all the activities of the startup. Many of the new innovative companies would be spin off from universities, from Ministry of Higher Education, could really help. Government could make sure that we put those ideas at the service of the community. So it's not only money, but I think it's example, uh, bus which would have no contact. 
contract, we will have a little battery for the to from this case. Just use the local bus company to implement it or out of the guide to make it. So there are a lot of things where the government can not only put money to support, but offer the possibility to use the local infrastructure. Some governments, I remember, for example, Chapra in the Emirates, they would put startups in contact with well-established large companies. So those are all things that the government can do. But in my view, what is important, and I definitely believe it, is the government should fix the purpose of the innovation. We should try to push the innovation in sectors which really matter more than others. And that's a very complicated question because it's an ethical question. I will go very rapidly. Uh, we saw last night what happened between Iran and Israel. So whoever controls the technology will have a clear edge of national defense. But we all know uh, you have probably seen the open hand of film. Uh, it also raises the question of up to where. And I know that some states wonder if they had done the right thing, not the right thing, to have brought that invention. Uh, secondly, you may have artificial intelligence. It raises millions of questions at the ethical level how it can be used. Uh, very often the Western world would challenge a little bit the way how China uses it. But I also know Westerners who are quite positive about the way how China does it. And even I was one surprise to hear that the Pope was interested in that model of giving good and bad poisons like the karma in India to the other. So those are ethical questions. I would go one step further, and that's something people hardly discuss. Progressive medicine. Fantastic. Everybody likes to increase the, the life of the people. But do we have a system to support those longer lives? Do we have old age pension support? Uh, very often in the Western world, the answer is no. Um, the cost for somebody in the U.S. the last 12 months for somebody who has a cancer is $250,000. So who pays for that? So one thing is to have the innovation, the, the invention, but the other thing is to have the social system in place so that you can support that invention. And last, of course, that's a field in which I feel very comfortable, which is climate, uh, anything which is environment, environment protection, I think it's the role of the government to give the right orientation. It can be either by penalties, it can be by incentives, personally I like much more the system of incentives, but the government in my view, more than just bringing the money, the government should bring a vision, and I would go one step further and say they should be an international government in fact, the UN today, we all know, is not representing in a fair way uh, the various parts of the world, but they should be the worldwide organization which is able to push the proposals and to try to slow down those which are harming our global common good. I, I don't think the role of the government is always bring money, but I, I do think there's some sort of foundations and programs. Um, maybe you're the uh, one to talk about uh, China, for example. What, are there example programs that the Chinese government prevented to encourage innovations for large or small organizations? Um, and I'm not, not an economist by training, uh, but I do know there's actually a debate When, whether or not, you know, the role of government in making, right, uh, that economic growth, uh, and in fact, 
spent six or seven times. You uh, heard in recent years a lot of that. It's criticized in Trump. You know. But, but in fact, when we look at Japan, uh, during the, the years of its economic America, even with the key role of, uh, uh, of helping the cutting edge uh, industries sectors in uh, Japan. And for not to mention that the United States now uh, has put in uh, uh, you know, hundreds of billions of uh, US dollars in helping the trade industry to grow. Um, so, so I think, uh, long story short, I think what government needs to do is that really not to uh, dictate, uh, but to serve. Um, and the uh, and the one thing, if you look at history, of the Chinese right in the past uh, the past years of uh, uh, reform, written well, one thing is very uh, typical of Chinese local economy is that we have to have this. Of really serving the business, including the investors from the outside of the locality or etc. So, this situation um, is about the emphasis, the role to pay as a service uh, for the other people. And this is the kind of life I'm thinking of whether you are the local government or So I think perhaps there is also a fine line in uh, you know, leaving that government to everything and know everything, I think, but rather try to play the role for the, 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 the business. I would like to add uh, two more points. I think uh, one of the things is that uh, we need to make sure we understand that the role of the government is to correct market failure. Market failures mean that when the market doesn't run effectively, when the private sector doesn't see that uh, very profitable for them to come in, even though that kind of activities or that kind of investment is going to bring values to the society. So I think the role of the government is very important in, in promoting this innovation in the way that they come in in the place where there's a market failure. Right? And it's for example, like, uh, for those investments that take a long term to be realize so the government need to come in in terms of education, in terms of investing in the R&D infrastructure, and also in the, uh, where you see that uh, there's a risk that the private sector is not going to take, so that they need to come in and leave risk, so that after what uh, like after intervention is done, the private sector uh, can find what that is um, acceptable for them to make the investment. So I think that is very important is that if there is no role of the government in, in making those long-term investments that may hard for countries to scale up or to rise up with the value change. And especially China did an excellent job in doing that, right? In terms of building infrastructure, in building especially education and our new infrastructure, and also providing public goods that are going to bring externality, positive externality to the economy. And secondly, I think it's very important about policy making this process. When innovation is going to bring in new solutions that is not currently regulated in the economy. So how the governments can come in to provide a safe place for entrepreneurs, the innovators, to test and do experiments, put down, uh, getting penalties because this is not regulated. So I think 10 bucks, uh, 10 bucks is very important. What is the term of innovation? Since that uh, the government allow for new things to be experienced within, uh, within a controlled environment, so that if this is successful, then it can scale up. If it's not successful, so it can uh, keep it there and then uh, cut it off. So I think those are the two key points. I think uh, that, that is the important role for the government is to, to, to stimulate innovation in the country to take off. Thank, thank you. I, I, I think we've run out of time and I want to be mindful that everybody needs to go to uh, the next uh, function. Um, the sum of this is from creative ideas to innovation, it takes a long time. There's a lot of failures, there's a lot of uh, commitment. A lot of companies that find it real hard. Uh, for example, we talked about Elon Musk building Tesla. 
the, the, the core mission of that is trying to transition the world to a more greener um, trans uh, um, uh, climate uh, planet. Earth. But you set the foundation where encouraging other entrepreneurs to build ecosystem around it. We look at China today as probably the largest EV uh, makers in the world, and it is exciting. This is not done. There are a lot of mistakes, there are a lot of money being thrown at it, both private sector and government uh, and the public sector. But um, not to underestimate the amount of time, money, that takes to come into realizing something from just creating five years. And uh, I want to thank um, all the panelists for joining us and thank you for listening. And uh, if you all have more questions, please see them after the panel. I'll see you at dinner. Thank you.